Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Gender Equality Academy webinar series. And uh, today we have uh, the webinar Mobilizing and Engaging, Creating Long-Lasting Commitment for Gender Equality in Research. My name is uh, Vasya Madesi, and I'm working as a project manager in B-Labs and Innovation Poll uh, in uh, Greece and Cyprus. Uh, and uh, I'm also the Deputy Coordinator of the Gender Equality Academy. Before we start with our webinar, and since I see that a lot of people are joining us, <coughs> I hope that you are remaining uh, healthy and safe at your home offices. And uh, I would like to start by presenting uh, a little bit about the Gender Equality Academy, what it is the project all about. So starting by uh, the challenge that we are trying to um, tackle is that at the moment there is a great number of gender equality programs and projects and a great gain knowledge and experience around this topic. But still there are a lot of uh, issues, uh, especially with researchers and practitioners that are not familiar with uh, uh, the theoretical and methodological concepts of gender and feminist scholarship. So what Gender Equality Academy does is that as an Horizon 2020 project uh, funded by uh, the European Research and Innovation Programme, it develops and implements a high quality capacity building programme offered uh, on the gender equality in research, innovation and higher education. Uh, at the moment, we are offering um, in-person training sessions, interactive and participatory workshops, summer schools, uh, interactive webinars as the one you are participating now. Uh, we are also um, on the making on our distributed open collaborative course that it is uh, also all online and we are offering a train the trainer session. Apparently due, due to the coronavirus outbreak in Europe, uh, we are unable to offer our face-to-face -face sessions, but we are still active on uh, the online and digital part. You may find more information at, uh, by visiting our website. Uh, we are a consortium of uh, 12 partners all around uh, Europe, combining uh, the knowledge and uh, contacting and implementing this high quality capacity building program. And uh, without any further delay, I'm presenting you uh, the agenda of today's webinar series. I would like to let you know that uh, we are also tweeting about um, the content of today's presentations on, on Twitter and you can follow up uh, there as well. And I'm giving the floor to uh, my colleague Maria Sanjunialno from Smart Venice. She will explain a little bit more about today's uh, content. Thank you. <clears throat> Oops. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm trying to um, share my screen. Let's see. Uh, Vasya, did you stop sharing yours? Yes, I did. Okay. Because the system is apparently resisting a bit. <laughs> okay, can you see my screen? Yes. No. Yeah. Okay. Great. Again, um, thank you, everybody, everybody, again for joining our webinar. Uh, my name is Maria San Giuliano. I am uh, the CEO and research director of Smart Venice. We are a research and consultancy company uh, based in Venice, Italy, um, specialized in inclusive innovation and uh, gender equality. And we are a partner of the Gender Academy, of course, in charge of uh, webinars and the forthcoming distributed online open course, the doc that um, Vasya was already uh, mentioning. Uh, you are here because um, the Gender Academy program is including uh, a webinar series. Um, the goal of this particular format uh, of GE Academy is uh, to make knowledge, tools, good practice example, examples available to a wider audience uh, in a compact um, but still uh, interactive format. Uh, 
Uh, we have planned uh, 12 webinars between this year and 2021 on different topics. Mostly they are uh, integrated uh, with uh, the rest of the um, offer, uh, meaning that they introduce, often they introduce in-person trainings and workshops on uh, similar issues. We might have a few more webinars uh, due to this um, uh, COVID-19 outbreak uh, that is, let's say, uh, leading us to this direction. Um, the, the webinar of today, we have set for uh, this meeting um, three learning objectives. On one side, uh, we want to uh, provide you with examples of uh, promising uh, practices uh, to mobilize horizontally and vertically uh, stakeholders in um, research organizations on gender equality issues. Uh, and provide successful examples also of men for gender equality. Uh, as uh, we know, they, uh, they, might have, uh, they may have a crucial role as uh, champions of um, uh, the goals of achieving gender equality and are crucial allies. Oops, sorry. We also want to, want to inspire you uh, to take uh, action. Uh, at your uh, institutions or to support research uh, institutions, institutions in taking actions um, if you are uh, experts or consultants. Uh, we will have two presentations uh, as you read already in the agenda um, from Intote Yurkute and Jeff Earn and the um, discussion uh, will be moderated by um, Anna Belena Mill from Central European University, who is also um, a Gender Academy uh, partner. Uh, very briefly, um, if you are not familiar with the platform, um, you can see at the bottom of the page there is the chat icon. Uh, you can use this one. Uh, we will collect uh, all the questions uh, during the speaker presentations and we will answer during the Q&A uh, question and answer ses sessions. Um, when you um, pose your, uh, your questions to uh, technical issues, if you have uh, any, please use the other uh, Q&A um, button that you, you can find to the right side. And finally, um, select uh, from the window here to the right side of the screen all panelists and attendees as an option um, when you pose your questions. I will now give the floor uh, to my colleague, Natasha Sega, uh, for introducing um, all our speakers. Hello to everybody and good afternoon also from my side. My name is Natasha Sega and I'm a project manager and researcher at Smart Venice. I'm glad to introduce you to Mintaute Yorkute, our first speaker, that is, she is the head of communication division at the Office of the Equal Opportunities Ombudsperson in Lithuania, and also a moderator of, our, of Equinet Communication Practices and Strategies Working Group. Mintaute, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, hi to everybody. I'm a bit nervous. This is a new way of presenting things I know, um, but probably we have to learn all of us to do that more often. So um, I would like to, to talk about why uh, words matter and how to unite storytelling and gender equality into one thing, one piece um, while communicating gender equality and um, and trying to, to, uh, to move towards a better world. Um, let me try to share my screen. Okay. So I hope you see that. Um, so things uh, I will tell you are very basic in the work of communication. However, the message that I would like to really to convey to you is that um, you need to think about people as of different genders, um, different ethnicity, age, ability or disability and other characteristics when speaking in academia. And it doesn't matter if it is 
only uh, while preparing a report or giving a speech to the audience in order to promote gender equality and uh, enhance a positive social change within the society uh, we really have to think about why words matter and uh, taking this responsibility to to really um, yeah change the world uh, in a way we communicate and um, in just a second oh yeah here we go so our societies are built on stories and you are the stories creator and you can either deny rights to, to people or cherish them and it's really entirely up to you how you do that and um, when you do that um, i would encourage everyone to to take a possibility and opportunity to really uh, step up and uh, each time when the um, moment occurs, be uh, an ambassador of, uh, of um, creating a change. And today I would like to also present you Framing Equality. It's a publication we made in, um, in Equinet together with the colleagues from other equality bodies across Europe. And you can um, find it online. I hope you will do that. Uh, we also have hard copies and I'm sure we still have them in, in the Equinet office, just let me know and uh, I will send to you uh, the hard copy, but it's available online. So before jumping into the framework of framing equality, I would like to give you some tips for communicating equality. And um, those are, well, very much connected with the um, with overall picture we have in the, in, in the world. And, uh, while you are communicating equality, you have to remember and also acknowledge uh, the inequality between men and women. Uh, you probably know and notice this um, during um, during your experiences in, in, in various backgrounds that historically women and men were treated equally, uh, not equally. And that's why we have this um, inequality at the moment. And um, we have to acknowledge it and uh, also kind of avoid the trap that uh, while we are speaking about the world objectively, uh, usually it's the male uh, perspective and the male as a default uh, in our world. So we really need to think about both genders when we are communicating. Uh, always consider and explain the difference the different impact on men and women and then again it doesn't matter what actually you are doing if it is a report if it is a survey if it is a research if it is any anything you are doing in your work and your personal life always consider uh, what what are the differences uh, of our actions uh, um, in a in a question of impact on men and women explain what gender has to do with a particular social problem inequality within the society and it's also important uh, especially when i see it in my practice uh, it's always uh, jumping um, into the in, into the public discussion uh, every time we, we communicate anything about gender equality that people do not understand what gender has to do with a particular social problem but it usually does and uh, we need to explain it uh, carefully and, um, and uh, quite often. Keep it simple and apply the down-to-earth approach. This is also very important. Um, use simple words and phrases for explaining complex concepts. Think of your grandma, would she understand you? This is a very valuable uh, tip for communication because really uh, every time you write something or you want to communicate something, you want to post something, try to think if it is really understandable and if it is um, um, something that your grandmother uh, would understand you. Embrace the positivity was positivity and during these days it's very uh, important especially because it's so negative around us and uh, it always is when you are talking about equality um, people are very tense uh, when when they hear this so you have to uh, remain positive as much as possible 
get visual as much as possible. And it is also uh, not because it's nice, colorful and, uh, and other things, but it's also accessible for everyone. And when I say this, uh, I really mean that um, because um, there are many researches and studies that shows that uh, visual material is accessible for any age people uh, from different for different ethnicity and um, nationality people um, various disabilities uh, you know all all these things matter when you are talking about communication it has to be as accessible for everyone as possible and if i would um, need to to leave you with one tip um, apart from others that would be uh, this one always segregate your data by sex and when possible by ethnicity disability age and other char characteristics because if you don't do that well if we don't do that then we don't really understand uh, why um, it's different for for different people in this world and uh, and we have huge data gaps and uh, and then everything that we are thinking or we are trying to do uh, it's it's becoming like uh, like a default like an object objective truth that uh, mainly is uh, male perspective uh, in our world and uh, now i would like to 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 talk a bit about uh, framing because this is a center um thing i would like to leave you with uh, that we have to be responsible for the way we are framing this world and um when I say framing, I mean uh, that, well, this is actually the way we see and understand the world uh, in general. Uh, and um, framing is always happening when we communicate. And uh, when we communicate, we create meanings and uh, those meanings we're using them later on. And uh, in the end, you know, we have the culture um, of the frames we are communicating and, and, and um, it becomes very natural to think in one ma manner or another uh, about the world. So activated frames, when we're using them often, they become common sense, the collection of fixed frames. And uh, why uh, it is important to know this is that um, it really entirely depends on us uh, which frames we activate and, um, and then uh, with communication tools, with the measures, with different measures we have, we can actually uh, put them as common sense if we use them often, if we use in the right way, if we use them in the right place. And, uh, and then, you know, like we, we, we can shape entire culture um, and uh, more equal cu uh, culture, embrace, embrace it uh, all together. So, this is uh, the main structure uh, that we would we need to think each time we do anything well we when we communicate and uh, communication is everything is what we hear what we see and what we say and uh, when you put it to the campaigns it's it's everything what you do on this campaign is all communication online offline media images and words slogans posters everyday speeches everything that you really uh, hear, see, and say this is communication, and framing is uh, is an approach uh, that help us uh, to to shape this uh, communication. As I said already, uh, and information um, in a way we need uh, to do uh, in order to to build a picture of of society that we want to build, and uh, this framing this. It, it, it goes to the thinking, the emotional and psychological, verbal and non-verbal ways that we respond to the world around us. Uh, everything uh, like stories, patterns, beliefs and assumptions, emotions and values, they are really uh, based on the frames we are using. And then, as I already mentioned, uh, it all goes to the culture, to the assumptions uh, we use, uh, to, to the, to the uh, things and behaviors that uh, we consider to be accepted and not accepted, social uh, and community cohesion, media and arts, everything, it, it goes to, to, to the culture. So uh, when you try to frame, to use frames you want to, um, 
we highly recommend uh, you to, to use those steps um, in, in the sequence. First, define the task, then create frames in one to create, test and refine. And uh, well, the fourth step is really not really a step, but but it should go with each step, uh, step um, together. It's educate yourself, be curious and learn more. And this is very important because if you are not using the lens of um, gender equality or equality in general, then uh, many things are missed out. And then we, we go back to the default that is uh, entirely male at the moment in our world. And um, let me go um, quickly through all these steps so, so you will know uh, more what I'm uh, referring to. So first of all about defining the task. Um, this is a very important step uh, with, without which you cannot really proceed. You have to um, get clear on your visions and goals and your goal, goals has to be smart. They have to be specific measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-specific. And um, when you have this, then you can move forward and to know uh, your audience. You have to think who, uh, who are they and what do you want to tell them. And uh, it will help you identify not only uh, challenges framing, because we always have challenges. We, we need to think of things that are not working at the moment. But it will help also to find the opportunities, because based on your audience, you can really check um, with uh, yourself and with, with the goals, what are the opportunities uh, that, that are uh, brought uh, to you by your audience. And, uh, also a very important step is uh, learning their stories and frames about your issue. In order to, pr to proceed, you have to uh, kind of map the, the, um, the ground and learn what is already uh, in the reality happening. What are the stories that are used? And, uh, and then, only then, you can really think of the ways how to reframe them if it is needed or how to use them in order to communicate things you would like to communicate. Uh, map your audience. Um, know, uh, well, try to analyze who are the base and the base are the ones you have already. They, they are your supporters, uh, the ones who believe in your goals, who are with you already. Um, then uh, who are the movable middle and this is the one you you need to really address because those are usually the majority of, of the population those are uh, the ones who do not know uh, yet if i if they support you or if they are very hostile with you and in in the way you frame and you work with with your audience you can move this movable middle to one side or another and then also map um, who are the opposition and in my practice uh, i would strongly recommend you do not work with the opposition uh, unless you have to and of course there are some some uh, things or situations when you have to to really uh, talk to your opposition, to, to people who oppose you, but uh, it's very time consuming. Uh, it's, very, uh, it's, it's, it's very uh, hard in a way and, um, and try not to if you don't have to, to work with them. And then the next step of yours should be uh, setting your framing tasks, the articulation the articulation of what you want uh, your communication to do and uh, well i recommend you to to <clears throat> to ask some questions uh, to you and your team you're working with what thinking do you need to challenge to reinforce if you have already something done in the field what shift is in thinking do you want to see and this is a very important homework you have to think about towards what goal you are moving and um, and what do you want to see as a result and how uh, will this contribute to your goal and vision altogether so again you are going back to your goal um, 
when you did all this defining the task homework I, I just uh, told you about, uh, you have to move to creating frames step. And uh, I would recommend uh, use five main principles um, on doing it. So first of all, speak to people's best self. This is very important because uh, if you will speak uh, negatively to them, they will not listen to you. You have to um, to encourage their their um, image of uh, their best self and um, yeah to to appeal to the people size that most people want to believe themselves to be because people they like to think about uh, themselves as better uh, human beings and you have to use this you have to address it in order to to achieve uh, your goals um, other principle is uh, creating common ground and uh, this is about finding and expressing your shared identity values and interests even when you don't think that there are ones uh, there's always the common ground and even with uh, people who are especially hostile to you and your approach uh, you can find that common ground because uh, some values and some some interests uh, they are universal and uh, if you can use them as much as possible talk about change uh, and uh, while doing it, make change feel possible. Show them their own role in the change. And it has to be as practical as possible. Because if you will talk only about uh, general things uh, in the world, uh, people won't connect to it. It, it has to be uh, very, very real to, 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 to the people. And uh, talking about reality, make it real. This is the next principle you, you should uh, embrace. Uh, avoid relying in the facts and statistics alone. And this is something uh, that uh, usually people get trapped with uh, because, uh, well, men, the majority of people think that, well, if we have facts and they are very uh, telling, that's enough. And people will read them, they, they will hear them, and then they will know, no, it's actually not working. You have to use um, instead stories and powerful images uh, from real world, real people with real stories uh, that would be emotional, that would touch people's uh, hearts and souls and uh, it, it, it is more powerful than just facts and statistics alone and I know that in academia especially people are uh, very confident about facts and statistics so even if you're using them, of course, use them as much as possible, um, but try to combine it with uh, real stories and with storytelling uh, techniques uh, in general. And the last framing principle is avoid reinforcing unhelpful frames. And with that, I mean, don't use don'ts and other negative demands they are not working if you do if you will uh, keep telling that do not do that or don't do that or it's not good to do that you know people they are lost you know like they they don't really want to hear that uh, they they are not there anymore instead use positive stories that i was already mentioning and um, try to tell the stories about the benefits of diversity why uh, why it matters and uh, and uh, what is the vision you have for this world and you are sharing uh, to, to them so always analyze your frames and um, this is a nice uh, picture i like um, that that uh, is very helpful while you are analyzing your frames think about first of all beliefs assumptions and values what do you have to believe to accept the frame as true? What are the unstated assumptions? What values are expressed? And with, uh, with that in mind, think about your characters, what roles and relationships are presented. Think about imagery. Uh, are there any visual or metaphorical images you could use? Uh, think about your focus. What is the most important? Uh, where do you want to, to head your spotlight? Uh, where is the conflict or challenge? You have to know all these focuses. 
and also foreshadowing uh, what will happen if the problem is taken to its extreme, what if the problem is resolved. So think about it as a bit theater about, about uh, yeah, like try to, to, to work with visual things, uh, with uh, emotions, with values, and, uh, and then it will be easier to build all the communication step by step. Um, and um, the, well, the last uh, very important step is test and refine. And the fundamental uh, lesson for communication is any testing is better than no testing. So you have to think about it, even if you don't have resources and usually people, they don't have resources for, for testing, at least in my country and, and uh, as I hear from my colleagues in other countries uh, as well, um, still try to think creatively how you can test them. And um, it can be, you know, um, anything. It could be survey, it could be focus groups that are very um, cost efficient because it doesn't cost so much. Uh, talk to your uh, friends or, or, or people who are not working in your field uh, because they can bring also valuable insights. Uh, but really try to test. If you have any messages, any posters um, developed or whatever, before the campaign starts, show to your audience uh, just in case if they will notice something that is not working, it's not use, useful or um, things like that. And after some time has passed, revise your frames, revisit the framing tasks. So uh, during the campaign and after the campaign, if you're building a campaign or, or if you are issuing a report or if you're giving a speech, uh, try to, um, after some time has passed, try to think about it and, um, and analyze it. Uh, did it uh, go well? What, what, what were the challenges and everything? And, um, uh, finally, measure the impact, monitor the impact, and evaluate the impact. This is very important. Sometimes we, well, quite often we forget to do that, but it's very um, well valuable if you want to continue with the with the work uh, you started, and uh, it will definitely help you to to move forward uh, later on with with next uh, communication and and framing uh, tasks. And uh, the last thing uh, that is actually not very last thing, but it should uh, be used in, in, in from the very beginning of uh, your journey of framing the world is educate yourself, be curious and learn more. And uh, I'm sharing with you some some kind of uh, some, some some books that uh, I found very usual, uh, very uh, good uh, in order to build the. Um, well, better my understanding, my knowledge on, on gender equality. So those are um, about gender equality and why it matters, what works, what doesn't work, what is um, data gap that we need to, to be aware of. And um, this slide uh, presents some um, storytelling books that I really liked and I think they are very use useful when when uh, you want to build your communication uh, about a better world and use gender equality as a lens as well. And uh, that's it uh, for what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that uh, we'll have a very uh, nice uh, question and uh, answers uh, session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Min Taute. It was really interesting and really useful, I believe. Let me share your screen with all of you and let me present you our next speaker, the Jeff Hearn, that is, uh, who, he, he is Professor Emeritus at the Anken School of Economic in Finland and also Senior Professor of Gender Studies at the Eurebro University in Sweden. He is also a Fellow of the UK Academy of Social Science, Honorary Doctor in Social Science at the Lund University and Professor Extraordinarius in University of South Africa. Jeff, the floor is yours, please. You can share now your screen.
Okay, can I trust everybody can see the um, PowerPoints and uh, good afternoon uh, from Helsinki. I'm delighted to be with you and uh, I'm going to approach what it's is a in some ways a quite a difficult story following Mintelto's presentation. It's actually going to start with raising some questions first of all is which is first of all you know why have changing men and masculinities what have they got to do with gender equality in research and let me just yeah okay that's better right and in a sense why should one bother talking about men and masculinities at all in trying to create this long-lasting commitment for gender equality research is it really possible at all to think we can actually achieve gender equality without changing men and masculinities um, one can make the, make the comparison perhaps with thinking about equality in terms of ethnic or racial terms can one actually achieve ethnic or racial equality uh, without changing white people I, I would argue i think not but it's a difficult question but we all know that gender inequalities persist uh, in research and in academia and educational science more generally but of course uh, for quite understandable reasons when one starts talking about gender equality many people perhaps most people immediately start talking about women and this is very understandable and very important but i would say gender equality concerns all people and it's very important not to see women as the problem and to change women and it's also important not just to rely on on gender mainstreaming gender mainstreaming can be very useful indeed it's got various pros and cons it can sometimes actually be a way of not dealing directly with some of the issues around gender equality so my focus is trying to talk about men uh, as part of the problem and changing men and in some ways this might seem obvious uh, to people I don't know it may seem obvious uh, but when actually if you look at debates on gender equality um, and there are many you know excellent EU documents reports and so on on gender equality but many of them are really rather strangely silent on men masculinities and this contrasts for instance with the debate around what is often called failing boys some boys particularly working class boys and boys say from migrant families not doing so well at school so the contrast between the strong debate about failing boys and the very silent debate sometimes uh, in terms of gender equality and research and science is is marked and in a way i would say that men are obviously really present in in, in science and academia and research but are a kind of absence at the same time they're like an absent presence that makes sense and it's important not to think about research just as being this ungendered non-gendered thing to which you then add on women it's not as if universities or research are non-gendered and then women are added on uh, that's not the way it is so let's just think about just for a moment just reflect uh, Mintata was talking about visuals pictures what's your what's your image what's your picture you know what do you count as a man or even a real man how does that work differently in different parts of the world um, what do you understand by masculinity i mean these are very big questions and men and masculinities are very diverse diverse in terms of ethnicity and sexuality and age and many many other issues so i mean, many people have a kind of quite a strong image of what a real man or a man or must just means and it's important to actually get that on the table and discuss it sometimes rather painfully perhaps in some contexts okay i mean for the rest of my little my brief time i'm just going to go through three very quick issues that i think are really important in terms of changing men and masculinities in in research in the research agenda the first one is to try and create try and move towards what i would call gender or more gender equal interactions like in everyday life <laughs> treating people equally uh, in research and in everyday life more generally that's the first one the second one is to look at the issue of men and masculinities in terms of the control of resources this is really important in terms of say research funding and research priority setting and, and so on um, and the third one in some ways is the one that well I'm one that spent I've been a lot of my time on personally which but I think it's a really important but actually very difficult area which is 
how men and masculinities figure as a kind of topic or in the actual content of doing gender equal gender equal research you know in terms of theories in terms of you know which approaches are encouraged or promoted or ignored or discouraged um you know is this relevant at all to doing research uh, and i'll come back to these three points now in quick order so that's my very simple agenda so the first one yeah how do we think more about and do more about encouraging and as Mintati said encouraging being positive about encouraging gender equal interactions in research in in everyday sense i mean i could give rob's example here which is when men walk along the corridor do they actually <laughs> do they actually say hello to women i mean this might sound a very ridiculous thing to raise but i know many many examples uh, I, I i live in finland and i work partly in sweden and uk and um there are many examples where particularly some senior men actually somehow seem to be able to look through women <laughs> and not even say hello not acknowledge but of course that's that's kind of an everyday sense but it's also cl clearly very important in doing research in terms of the dynamics of research teams whose voice gets heard whose voice gets talked down uh, you know how projects are organized more or less equally um, and so on what is the if you like the climate and the culture in a research project in a research group and issues of homosociality of particularly heterosexual men preferring the company and valuing other men uh, in a homosocial way is a really really central issue here i think then there are the important issues of lgbtiqa plus lesbian gay bisexual transgender intersex queer agenda plus and i mean this is a really important you could say huge complication of in terms of not only talking about women and men and 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 similarly in terms of thinking about other issues around anti-racism and anti-ageism as i already said men and masculinities are not just one thing there's lots and lots of, of guidelines on this kind of area online if people are interested they can email me and i can send you more but here is one little list from actually the early 80s which i really like is tips for responsible action for men i won't go read it through you can probably see limiting our talking time to our fair share not interrupting who is speaking becoming a good listener that's very difficult for many people giving support empowering women relaxing which i'm trying to do now and there's some difficulty but not speaking on every subject not putting others down and so on interrupting others including other men's oppressive behavior so these are kind of you could say just guidelines on the kind of things that will be quite good to introduce into research into the doing of research and research projects and research teams the second one i want to raise is in some ways a more structural issue if you like a more organizational issue it's about men and masculinities in terms of trying to create more gender equal control of resources research resources and this applies both to research uh, funding organizations and rfos and research performing organizations which typically have very unequal structures gender structures um, in different countries of the world i mean this varies a lot but uh, that's a kind of typical situation with men tending to be at the top of those organizations and this affects very much funding and priority setting you know, which kinds of research which sectors of research technological medical social science and so on are actually given more funding support and changing this involves both from the bottom and from the top and it's very difficult to change some organizations actually without in fact support from the top so this is a major agenda i think um, in terms of actually changing the control of research resources but it also relates to the question of projects as well um, who are the project leaders how are project leaders selected who is sponsored which particular say postdocs postdoctoral researchers are seen as being the future project leaders there are some universities doing really good programs on you know thinking ahead trying to develop future leader programs for women and men and further genders 
Uh, but not all. In fact, the majority perhaps are not thinking about this way, but future project leaders is, an, is a key issue. And also a, a word of caution here that around the whole center of excellence or excellence debate, sometimes giving lots and lots and lots of money to very few centers of excellence, sometimes led by very high output productive men, isn't always the best use of resources. <clears throat> it can mean that actually around that cluster, there are some people who actually are not very productive. So the center of excellence or the excellent debate in research is a very complex one. Um, it doesn't automatically, in fact, uh, mean the best use of resources, so to speak. And then it's overcoming resistance. And resistance, um, which you could say is a negative issue, but if you like, being a having a positive agenda for thinking about different kinds of resistance that there are to change is also something that we have to deal with and confront. In Tauti was talking a lot about facts and figures, and um, I'm not going to <laughs> show many. Uh, the she figures published a couple of years ago are, um, and the previous years are an invaluable source of information. Uh, this one is about the women, uh, women leaders of higher education institutions and its variation across Europe with men dominating in many, uh, country, most countries. And this one is in terms of scientific boards. Um, and uh, what just as a kind of way of flipping the discussion, if one turns this around in terms of taking these kind of figures and looking at the percentage of men in research gatekeeping rather than only the percentage of women, one finds, okay, in Spain, leaders of higher education institutions, 92%, Cyprus, 90%, the mean average, nearly 80%, scientific boards, about similar, 88%, the average again, three quarters, in, uh, in av on average in the EU and the chairs and leaders of scientific boards again 100% in some countries and about 80% across the EU so I mean this is a really structural problem. Okay my third area which are some some in some ways it's the, I think perhaps even more challenging is to work on changing men and masculinities in gen or towards gender equal research content and this of course varies quite a lot depending on what kind of research you're doing you know if you're an astrophysicist that may be a bit different to, to if if you're a, a cultural studies person and and so on and so forth there are clear variations here but one of the things that is important uh, across probably all fields is what i would call naming men and masculinities you know if you're doing a study should we say on I don't know, top managers of the 100 biggest corporations in the world, it's pretty difficult to avoid naming men <laughs> masculine in that situation. Yet if you read a lot of management studies textbooks, you won't find management, top management particularly, talked about in this way uh, in both research and teaching. But this also, on the other hand, involves both naming, as with naming white people, should we say, but also what I would call deconstructing assumptions that making the point that men and masculinities are not essentially any Pacific X uh, or Y or Z. Um, it also involves thinking very carefully about the context, the societal context of power, gender power, as has been raised already. It also involves supporting and respecting feminist and gender research and studies. I know of research projects on gender or so-called uh, projects on gender where feminism or feminist theory on fem research is not respected and this is not, uh, not acceptable. But uh, and also involves gendering what may appear to be less gendered or ungendered areas. Climate change, information technology, robotics, global finance is a very big issue. You know, how can one discuss global finance without noticing men and masculinities control most of it? My last um, issue question is, so what encourages men or might encourage men to get more involved in promoting gender equality in research? Okay, this diagram, this triangle is probably familiar to many of you. It originates from an earlier version from Mike Mesner from the mid nineties, but the, the, this is like three motivations why men might get involved more in gender equality. One is, the kind of justice position, stopping men or some men's privilege, getting more just and better research, a kind of anti-privilege social justice position for a better world, the top of the triangle. The bottom right-hand uh, corner is looking at 
highlighting differences amongst men, neglecting perspectives. Um, I mentioned LGBTIQ. I mean, it may be that one motivation is to bring forward a perspective that, say, of, from men of colour, should we say, or migrant men, or men with disabilities that is not currently respected or highlighted. And the third one is prioritising costs of masculinity. I mean, changing life priorities, you know, changing work-life balance, reducing long hours, getting a better life, basically, and actually changing the relationship of men, both individually and collectively, to the business of research, however fascinating and passionate we are about it. That's my uh, 15 minutes. Uh, there are many, many, many resources available now. There are EU projects, there's ChromeNet, GenPort, the role of men in gender equality projects, which reported about five years ago. There's a lot of work from NGOs, Men Engage Alliance, I would wrongly, uh, strongly uh, recommend. There's NGOs like Sonki Gender Justice in Africa, particularly. And of course, there's the EU she figures, because I think we have to be informed, even though sometimes facts and figures aren't always everybody's cup of tea. Thank you. That's my time. Thank you very much, Jeff, for this super interesting presentation. It was really, really, really interesting from my side. I found it illuminating. <laughs> Let me now introduce you our moderator. I hope you can see my screen. That is um, Anna Belen Amil of the Gender e Equality Academy Consortium. Uh, she is the Gender Equality Officer at the Central European University in Hungary for the EU-funded project Supera. And uh, she also holds a Master's Degree in Women's and Gender Studies. Uh, Anna, please, the floor is yours. And I invite you, all of you now, uh, to type your question in the chat box since we will open the, the, que the question and answer session. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I'm going to be collecting your, your questions for, the, for our panelists to, to reply. But first of all, I would like to ask you one question that now Natasha is going to be releasing. What was the share of women among leaders of higher education sector institutions in European countries in 2017? I ask you to please. Um, select the answer, 5%, 12%, 21% or Okay, I see that most of you have replied uh, 12%, uh, but the correct answer is 21%. Uh, Jeff um, uh, was uh, talking, was presenting the, the numbers of the She Figures Report 2018. So only 21% of um, higher education institutions have uh, female, female heads. So, Going to collect your questions now. Um, I don't see many, so I would like to start with one question for, for Minta, but I think it also addresses something that Jeff was uh, mentioning. Uh, Minta, uh, uh, you were, you were uh, mentioning in your presentation um, on how to communicate inequality between men and women and how to um, convey the message that uh, 
genders are impacted differently uh, in different problems, with different problems in, in, in life, in the real world. And I would like to ask you, um, if you if you can advise us on some communication strategies to break uh, this um, binary, uh, this gender binary that is generally um, the framework in which people think about gender, or men and women, and how we can introduce um, people that are gender non-conforming or non-binary people into our communication strategy. Uh, it's, a, it's a hard one, uh, not, uh, not an easy answer uh, to this question, but um, yeah, I would suggest to use storytelling as much as possible. Show, show real people, show, expose their stories, expose their reality and uh, support it with, with facts and the data, of course, but try to talk to, to people's uh, emotions and hearts and, uh, you know, it's 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 a common um, common thing that uh, when we know somebody personally, uh, if it is I don't know LGBT person, an elderly uh, person from other country uh, that we have a hostile um, image uh, about. You don't. You 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 are not that uh, opposing anymore because this is personal. You know them, and uh, it's it's they are not dangerous. They they don't look uh, weird, uh, etc. So basically, you what you have to do this with your communication as well, and that means uh, tell the real stories of real people and show them as as much as possible, and uh, talk positively. Really, try to uh, embrace positivity in every step. Uh, don't try to avoid, don't try to, uh, to neglect, to refuse answers. Do it um, with, with positive message and uh, with explaining what is, uh, why do you say that? Why, why it is important, uh, why it matters to real people. Can Thank I comment? You. Can I comment? Uh, we have two two other. Okay. Yes, of course. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> All I was going to say. I mean, I think yeah. I think it's a really good point talking about storytelling and, in a sense, talking from where people are at. If you understand, you know, what actually is the way to communicate. I, um, I think the thing about facts and figures. Uh, I think I wanted to add. Really, I think people, particularly who are responsible as gender equality experts and advisors, as I know some of you are who, who, are, who are listening here, I think it's really important that also people are very familiar with the situation. Uh, and I mentioned she figures, I think at least once or twice. And I think it's really important to be aware of that really important information because I'm, I've been in situations where you give information like this and people in the audience who are researchers, academics say, oh, that's wrong. <laughs> they, you know, one has to actually in a sense also both have this knowledge base as well as being able to communicate and uh, impart the stories in a sense. Both things I think are important. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, another question for Minta, um, if you could share a good example of communicating uh, about gender equality. Um, if you, uh, I assume here, Igana, uh, the participant is um, interested in some best practice, and maybe a communication campaign that you can reference, um, give us as a reference. Well, it's hard to think uh, like, like that uh, at the moment. I need to think better because, uh, well, Many, many campaigns, they have uh, challenges uh, and, um, and I don't know if there is a one perfect one, probably not, uh, but I like he for she campaign uh, really a lot because I think that this is uh, mm -hmm. positive and it's also very inclusive um, to um, everybody. Uh, usually, when we hear about gender equality, people think that it's only about women and uh, about uh, their equality, you know, feminism is for women and, and all this thing I think you heard many times. So he for she, I think it's, uh, it's a good uh, example how to do it a common ground for everybody. Um, 
I like everyday sexism um, project, but it's more project, not a campaign. Okay. Well, there are many, but, uh, but well, it's always a challenge. Uh, when I think about the campaigns we did, and uh, we did quite many on um, gender-based violence and, um, and other uh, gender equality issues. And it's always, you know, like, well, I saw it also in chat, uh, many questions about that, why, why I would suggest not to talk to the opposition. You know, sometimes we, we really uh, use so many resources that we don't have really uh, to address all the negative comments, address all the position, you know, the ones who are shouting the loudest. And sometimes we miss uh, our opportunity mm -hmm. to really talk to the people who would support us and uh, who would like to learn more, but they can't because everything what we do is actually just you know, telling um, telling people why, you know, like gender equality matters uh, in the first place. So, you know, all, all these things, they always come uh, when when the campaign is, is, is going out. Yeah, I, every time we talk about gender equality, we hear this, what about men question. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a good question, but uh, it's only a good question if you really want to know the answer and not really trying to kind of silence me uh, because you think that, uh, aha, you know, I just uh, get you there and, you know, like, uh, uh, it's all about women and, you know, women issues and everything. That's why I say that, you know, you have to think about your resources and use them smartly, not to really uh, enter the, these games of, of, of war between genders, because there is no war, you know. I don't know if, it, if I'm clear on that. Yes, thank you, Minta. Uh, one question for both of you, both for Minta and for Jeff. Um, uh, it's about how to engage publics and individuals who believe that equality has been achieved. Um, there's this uh, common idea that um, basically uh, gender equality has, is already in place and there's no more to do about it. Um, do you, can you share with us some strategies uh, that we can use to address this public? Um, can I, shall I say something? Yeah, please yes. go ahead. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, and one other, yeah, one other person on the chat talked about uncomfortable conversations as well. Yeah, which is related, mm -hmm. I think, to your question, your point. I mean, I think I would begin by, in a sense, not being apologetic at all about equality and gender equality. That's one thing. Um, and also, um, perhaps thinking also and trying to open up what is included in term or <clears throat> the, the frame, if you like to use that word, uh, gender equality. I mean, often it's talked about in terms of, should we say, um, opportunities in, in schooling and education and, and workplace. But if one thinks about gender equality, even beyond that, to such issues of how people use their time, um, I think that's a very important way of thinking about gender equality more broadly. Um, and the time use, if you like, of, of, of women and men and further genders is very uneven indeed. That's one thing. And another example is around violence. And of course, this, talking about violence isn't always very easy. I appreciate that. But um, as I'm sure some of you know that the uh, Fundamental Rights Agency, FRA, report on violence against women in EU countries some of the high or the highest figures in fact that were reported in the questionnaire interviews were actually from the Nordic countries this, is, this doesn't mean they are the most violent it means that the women were most willing to disclose that to researchers um, but violence against women is a, re a really clear and obvious aspect of gender equality or inequality I should say and then another example is around age. I'm really interested in age. I'm just finishing a book on age with Wendy Parkin, my colleague who's 83, this week actually, or next week. And um, the gender pay gap is talked about a lot. 
and it's, it has changed a little bit, but it's changing very slowly. I'm talking here about Europe particularly. But the pension pay gap is much, much bigger in many countries. And that is something which I think is a way of thinking about gender across ages as well, um, across, if, across the life. <laughs> so it might be that some people may not experience gender inequality that minute, that time, that year in their life, but they might well do they might well have done so at school or they might well do in the future. So one th has to think about these things in a longer term uh, perspective. But uh, just to go back, I would not, I think avoiding being apologetic and, and, and having, treating uncomfortable conversations as kind of normal and relaxing about that, I think is very important, including in teaching actually as well, in, in, in higher education and other parts of educational teaching, I think is actually central. I would add. Uh, Minta, thank you. would you like to add something? Yeah, uh, thank you, Jeff. I think that was uh, very good uh, insights. I would add that uh, in this case, you should expose data as much as possible, and especially data gap that we have about the uh, about uh, different mm. sexes. Yep, and, that's uh, very true. That that helps because, of course, uh, I I meet many people who say that oh, gender equality is already in the past, and you know, all like uh, inequality. I mean, and you know, all like we already achieved it. But when you tr uh, expose data, when you show, and it's actually very good. This one, the book, if you really want mm. to expose data, mm. uh, because it shows step by step the 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 data gap we have and. Uh, and uh, it helps to, to really show that, look, your reality is different, you know, gender equality is not achieved yet, and we have to work on that better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I'm taking one last question, uh, because we're, we're a bit late. <laughs> uh, it's a question for Minta from Bente. Uh, she's asking, how do you deal with the challenge on about on one hand, using storytelling and personalized stories, and on the other hand, the problem of unconscious biases and the risk of re-stereotyping. It's a, it's a tough question. There is no uh, one perfect answer. You have to try. You have to try different ways of, of telling the stories. Uh, try to include different stories. Um, do not put all your communication on one story, try to, to, to think about differences, uh, about uh, different examples of the stories and, and just see what happens, what, what's working and what is not. It's also uh, part of testing. Some things are not working and some are really working. And I never know um, in the beginning of the campaign which will work and which will, won't work, you know, like it's, it's a process and you have to react, you have to see how people are addressing sometimes we try to put kind of um, you know uh, like how do I say um, sometimes before you uh, the campaign is starting you, you try to think where exactly you will have challenges and uh, it never happens you know like before campaign you think that okay this one will be tough and we need the explanation you prepare the explanation and then the campaign is going uh, into public and you see that nobody's really thinking about the things you were trying to prevent uh, they are actually thinking about other things you didn't even think about before the campaign so it is a process and you have to see you have to look at it and when you see that you are maybe creating biases, uh, you know, like, or enforcing them, you have to change the tactics, you have to change the community, you have to explain why it's not working and, uh, and yeah, it's a process. Can I comment? Sure. Well, I mean, one, one thing, I mean, uh, I'm not Thank quite you sure. Thank very much, Min. Sorry? Um, I think we're already, yes. Shall I comment or not? Yes, please, Jeff, go okay. ahead. Yeah, yeah, okay, briefly. Yes, I mean, yes. I think one, one issue uh, uh, to follow uh, Mintala's comment is, is that, of course, there are many, many established stories <laughs> going back, you know, the, the, there are fairy stories and childhood stories. There are many kinds of stories that are very, very established in, in culture. And of course, one way is to tell those, some of those stories in a different way, perhaps in a surp surprising way, in a so-called non-stereotypical way. 
uh, by sort of reversals that can also of course be tokenism as well and can be criticized for ignoring some of the realities such as around violence that you say example but one thing I wanted to mention actually is about the use of pronouns uh, gendered pronouns and this of course varies in different languages quite a lot but one of the things I think is becoming more uh, more common in, in some parts of the world at least uh, is to ask say students uh, what uh, pronoun do you want to use you know do you use he or she or another pronoun of your choice of course in some languages like Finnish everybody is Han so it, it, it's a bit different but uh, I think that may be a, just a, a small simple uh, linguistic example of uh, changing some stories in some cases thank you Jeff uh, I think we run out of time. Uh, Natasha? Uh, yes, thank you very much to, to all of you and for all your questions. For those who didn't receive an answer, uh, we will uh, collect all the questions and we will try to answer to you by email if you indicate your email address while you have registered. Thank you. Thank you very much. I leave the floor to Maria for a final wrap up and then we will conclude it. Thank you very much also from my side uh, to both Mintaute uh, Jeff for their very insightful and uh, really inspiring presentations, but also for, to Anna uh, for uh, a very good moderation of this uh, webinar. Uh, the keywords that I, I, I have um, here uh, in my notes uh, uh, from, from uh, this very interesting uh, session uh, was really um, are really including uh, a few um, issues such as um, storytelling, uh, uh, the importance of storytelling, and complementing um, data with uh, real real stories, uh, which actually is a bit uh, challenging or might be a, a bit challenging in an academic uh, uh, context. Um, uh, the issue of uh, uh, keeping uh, positive uh, while we want to be critical or to use uh, critical approaches uh, to studying and to addressing um, inequalities in institutions. Uh, but still it's very important as um, uh, Mintaute was, was showing and encouraging us to uh, focus uh, efforts on the so-called movable middle. Uh, from actually from uh, Jeff, um, we heard uh, about the importance of uh, keeping together the two different levels of the micro everyday interactions uh, when including uh, an engaging man into the conversation um, to to fight inequalities, but also the macro, meso and macro levels of the control of resources which uh, show how, how actually uh, power imbalances are uh, working at the different level. Uh, he referred to homosociality as an issue that has to be uh, tackled. Uh, and I was noticing that actually um, uh, also gender equality communities uh, are quite uh, indeed uh, homosocial. Uh, we had just 11 men registered to this participant to this webinar, sorry. And we, uh, we are really now acquainted to discuss gender equality issues among women only and mostly uh, white and middle class uh, women. Uh, so for, from both speakers, I, I thought it was very important the uh, uh, mention and the, 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 their attempt to address intersectionality. Uh, so broad enough, um, the gender equality issue uh, to uh, other uh, discrimination and uh, differences, which is uh, more and more uh, important also at the communication and engagement level. Um, the, the, the final discussion we had here also with our um, participants and the questions which were raised are also very, uh, w went straight to the point uh, of addressing really some critical uh, aspects because uh, we are actually referring to uh, carrying out uh, communication campaigns at the institutional level, engaging stakeholders within institutions on a topic like gender equality, which 
is actually becoming out there in the society more and more often, let's say, uh, a site of tension in terms of um, radicalized anti-gender ideologies that we, in a way, in a way or another, affect uh, what we try to uh, achieve within institution institutions and trying to set up institutional change uh, processes. So uh, I think that we could continue with the discussion uh, for, for a long time, but we had to uh, uh, really um, close the webinar and um, thank, thank you very much again uh, to our speakers, moderators, all the participants and um, goodbye to the next one. Basia, please, uh, would you uh, uh, tell us more about our next uh, uh, dates and uh, how we continue with Gender Academy. Oh, you could you couldn't hear me. Thank you yeah. very much, Maria, and everyone for the very uh, insightful presentations. So a little promo now for the next uh, webinar. We hope you enjoyed uh, this one very much. So uh, the next one is on the 23rd of April. It's on how to strategically frame gender equality policies and set priorities for change at your university. Uh, it is also at the same time, so we hope to see you uh, there as well. Uh, this is the preliminary agenda. You can find the registration form on uh, the GE Academy website. And uh, thank you once again. After closing uh, your windows, an exit questionnaire will pop up and uh, we would really like to hear your views uh, to become better for our forthcoming sessions. Thank you very much and uh, have a great day.